Well, I don't know how to dance. Kind of wish I did, but I've got some brushes here that I think do a pretty good job. And we're going to kind of put that to the test today. Some new brushes I've never used before, some I've rarely used, and I'm going to limit myself to these brushes. So let's see how that works out. What are you talking about? You've never danced a day in your life. Watching Singing in the Rain doesn't count. Hello, Minders. Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. Well, today I set myself a challenge, which uh, I think will be really, really fun. Now, if you saw my video not too long ago on detail brushes, I mentioned a brush that I had never used, and that was the Wedge. It's prized, I think, among floral painters a lot of times because it, there are like single stroke things you can do to make leaves and petals and whatnot. But it impressed me just with a little testing I did of, of how dancey and calligraphic the point was i also uh, mentioned daggers which i've used a little bit but not a lot so i've got three daggers here two uh, princeton neptune they're dry so they're not showing a point and then this uh, princeton aqua elite same with the daggers they're used a lot uh, to make flower petals floral and botanical strokes and decorative painting but again I, I have used them and they make some really interesting marks and the only big brush I'm allowing myself is the silver brush, black velvet. This is a three quarter inch oval wash. That's what I'm gonna do. And so I'm gonna do a spontaneous painting with those and I'm really anxious to do that. And we're gonna let those brushes just dance. They will make marks uh, that your hand really hadn't anticipated. You have to kind of familiarize yourself and kind of accept the lack of control that you will have. But by the same token, you can get down here with this razor point and do some detailing. Really cool. And I love to put parameters on myself like this to make it more fun. Now, I just want to mention the paper. It will not be in a link below because this is Artist Loft paper from Michaels. This is actually their 100% cotton paper. They have a 100% cotton paper, and I suspect that it's Fabriano Artistico because it says made in Italy, and it was about the same price. So the fact that it came from Michaels and is an Artist Loft product uh, is not doing anything for the price, to be honest. So that's what I'm using. And color-wise, we will be using my Mgram 10 color set. I'll be limiting myself to that. Further, I will probably be in a very limited color scheme. I want to do some blues and oranges and maybe some yellows and greens. So, time to dance. All right, well, just going to start out by pre-wetting this palette and kind of setting up some sectors of color. Actually, that scarlet pure all there, I didn't use that much. But we'll get into that. If you would hang on to the end, we'll have a discussion about color scheme and the colors that I use. I get asked so often about what colors I use, and it's a very complex subject. And I wanna talk about how I set up this color scheme and how it ended up working. Sometimes I don't even know till I'm almost done how it's all gonna work out, how the colors are gonna blend, at least in the spontaneous process, that's true. Just uh, laying in the foundational washes, and this is just going to be a standard spontaneous painting. But here I'm going to use this to get these uh, details, these edge details, instead of my normal rounds or detail brushes. I'm going to use the dagger and the wedges. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more coming up. But aside from using the daggers and the wedges, it'll be a standard spontaneous painting.
All right, well, let's make a little sidebar here, uh, interrupt the painting, just to kind of uh, give you a little bit more of a close-up view of what's going on and what it is that I'm looking for. Essentially, we're talking about edges. When you paint a detail, for instance, you paint a tree, you have to be uh, conscious of your edges and the marks that the brush makes. You can do it with a standard round brush like this just fine. I do it all the time. If you're painting, you know, a tree. You just have to be conscious and aware of what the tip is doing. So when we talk about a brush that dances, what are we talking about? We're talking about a tip that has a tiny bit more mind of its own. Now, depending on how hard you choke up on it or how you approach the strokes, you may not see any difference. But what I love about these long, skinny points is that, uh, especially if you hold the brush further back, and you can do that with a regular round too, you just get marks that are not as deliberate. I just feel like they're a little bit more organic. They skip and skitter and just kind of go ways that you're not necessarily trying to make it do. You can maybe make it look exactly the same with a round brush, but until you try it, see what I'm talking about, you may not understand it. But it, it is a looseness and a mark-making process that's just fun to play with. So if you're in a tightly controlled spot, this is not what you're going to want to do. The neat thing about these wedges I'm finding out, though, is that you can choke up on them and be very controlled with them. Again, it is a razor. If I turn it sideways, you can see it is a razor fine point. And then also, you've got these, these lovely marks when you brush it sideways that are a little different than this when you use a round. Both are fine, both are acceptable, but you, it's just a different way of making marks. Simple as that. If I do uh, a bit of a cluster of leaves like that, it's just different. There's there's more angular strokes. There's a more randomness and less sameness to each of the little bits and pieces. That's what we're talking about. Minute differences, but significant nonetheless. And so this is the point. You know, this is uh, showing it in action. This is that wedge, and it's just really kind of cool to play with. The marks just seem to be a little more angular, but you can also get these details, like see me putting in the tree trunks and branches. Uh, you get up there, choke up on that brush, and it work, makes an excellent detail brush, like almost rigor-like. So I really had no trouble, you know, making the transition to these brushes. And the final result may not be extremely apparent. But I felt the difference as I was working on it, especially on these little frilly foliage details. They were neat brushes. There in that little patch, you can just see the, the hopefully you can see the shapes of everything. The little marks that it makes are just slightly different than around. Yeah, so as mentioned, it's just something you have to experience and play around with, uh, just so you can see the difference.
All right, so I just decided I wanted a few sparkles uh, in that center detail area, it's sort of my center of interest. So all I'm doing is spattering in white ink. And that's what it is, just white ink. It's time to peel back the tape, take a final look. Pretty happy with it. In that upper corner there, um, I had some things that looked like a kind of rocky ridge spine on a mountaintop. So when I see something like that, I think, well, let's just make sure it does look like that. <laughs> let's enhance that and make that part of the picture. Why not? It's my painting. I can do what I want. Anything that you want, you can build here. This is your world. All right, I just wanted to take a minute to talk about color scheme. Whenever I do any painting, spontaneous or otherwise, I'm always asked, uh, what color did you use? What color is that? What color is that? So I'm using Indian yellow. I'm using dioxazine purple. I'm using red iron oxide and ultramarine blue. And just occasionally, uh, because they were out, uh, there might be some neutral tints, some pearl scarlet. But it's primarily these four colors here. Now let me show you the magic of those four colors. Basically, the, the yellow, Indian yellow and the dioxazine purple will gray each other out to a certain extent. And you'll end up with a brownish hue. So that's a lot of what's happening here. You see sort of a grayed purple in many areas. Then you'll see uh, bits of ultramarine blue coming in here and there, and bits of red iron oxide in places. And those colors gray each other out. So it ends up with a nice overall muted tones. Looks like you painted with all kinds of colors. And then the Indian yellow and the ultramarine blue will sometimes bring in some greens. They'll mix to make a muted green. So those near complements are really great to work with. Once again, Indian yellow and gamboge, if you're looking for an alternative, is a good alternative. The near complement of dioxazine purple, red iron oxide, or uh, you could also use burnt sienna, or quinacridone rust, and good old ultramarine blue. Get those colors and try it. And you could dominate your painting with a different color, maybe more of the purples, and just bring in bits of the other colors. You see here, here I got a nearly Payne's gray neutralization. So you have plenty of ways to be dark and neutral with that limited color palette. And if it's easier to use neutral tint, bring in some neutral tint. So that's uh, one way I approach color. And just asking me which color did I use is really kind of an insufficient way to explain it. So I hope that was helpful. All right, thanks everyone. I appreciate you watching. Maybe this is another one here that you'd be interested in seeing. Catch everybody in the next video. Bye-bye.